Welcome back students. This is Mr. Parsesian. In today's lesson, we are going to be talking about a concept in chemistry known as stoichiometry. And what we can do with stoichiometry, as you look at the learning goal there, is it allows us to calculate the relationship between the amount of a reactant or the amount of a product that we have in any given chemical reaction. And of course, when we talk about amount, there's a lot of different ways that we can measure amount. We can measure the amount in moles, in mass measured in grams, volume measured in liters or cubic decimeters, or particles, uh, which could be either atoms or could be <laughs> molecules. And so in this particular lesson, we're gonna learn how to relate reactants with products, uh, and that's in either direction, uh, trying to understand how many, how much of a product is produced in a particular reaction or how much of a reactant is required for a particular chemical reaction. So here we're going to start with something that we're familiar with, the synthesis of water. So we know that water is composed of two elements, hydrogen and oxygen. We also know that hydrogen is a diatomic molecule. It shows up as H2. And oxygen is also a diatomic molecule. It shows up as O2. And when the two, the two, the two react, hydrogen gas and oxygen gas, uh, it produces water for us, and we know that the chemical formula for water is H2O. Now, as we look at the models that we've used for this particular reaction, something should look not quite right to us. Uh, if we look at the two reactants, uh, we can see that both hydrogen atoms in the H2 molecule show up as a product here, uh, but only one of the oxygen atoms show up as a product, which means that we have a leftover oxygen uh, atom. And so as a result, if we want to have uh, the reaction go to completion, it's going to happen a little bit different as how we have it represented here. So in order for this reaction to go to, com to completion, we would need a second diatomic hydrogen molecule uh, and then as a result, we would end up with a second water molecule. And so now you can see I've got four hydrogen atoms on the reactant side and the product side. I've got two oxygen atoms on the reactant side and the product side. And so very often we would represent this with a balanced chemical equation saying that we've got two H2 molecules, one O2 molecule to produce two H2O molecules. And so the ratio of the reactants and the products in this would be two to one to two. And that ratio holds uh, regardless of how many of these molecules we want to have react. So for example, if I have four H2 molecules, then I know that would require two O2 molecules to produce four water molecules. And the ratio that we have here, four to two to four is the same ratio that we had here, two to one to two. And so understanding that the coefficients of a balanced chemical equation helps us to relate the number of each reactant with the number of each product that's produced in a chemical reaction uh, allows us to understand the basic concept in stoichiometry. And so when we talk about stoichiometry, we can use the coefficients of the balanced chemical equation for any particular chemical reaction to relate the amount, which could be again mass, volume, moles, or particles of a product or reactant in a chemical reaction. And so now we're gonna take a look at a couple examples. All right, so the first example that we're gonna take a look at, here we've got hydrogen gas reacting with nitrogen gas to produce ammonia. Uh, and so again, we need to start with a balanced chemical equation. Hydrogen gas we know is H2. Nitrogen gas is also diatomic, it's N2. And then ammonia, uh, you probably wouldn't need to know this, but you probably will after a period of time. Ammonia's formula is, chemical formula is NH3. So now we can see that this, uh, this equation is not balanced. We don't have the same number of hydrogen and nitrogen on both sides of the equation. And so in order to balance that, we would need a coefficient of a three in front of H2 and a coefficient of two in front of the NH3. Then we've got the same number of hydrogen and nitrogen atoms on both sides of the equation. So using this chemical equation, now we can answer questions like this. How many moles of ammonia are produced from three and a half moles of nitrogen gas? And so then to be able to answer that, 
Um, I like to use a tool that we refer to as the expanded mold diagram. So this is the expanded mold diagram, uh, and that is available in the Google Classroom under uh, uh, different resources. So if you look under the resources portion, you can find this expanded mold diagram. Okay. So here, if we go back to the question, it is asking me to go from moles of nitrogen gas to moles of ammonia. Uh, and so nitrogen gas is what I'm starting with. And so we would consider that to be moles of A. And then uh, we are trying to figure out the number of moles of ammonia. So we would consider that moles of B. And so you can see that this is a one-step process going from moles of A to moles of B. And it says here the way that we do that is to multiply by some factor. And so what we discussed earlier is that the factor is actually the coefficients of the balanced chemical equation. And so I'm going to show you uh, on the whiteboard how we would make that calculation. Uh, if you have printed out a copy of the expanded mold diagram to use for this unit, um, I would suggest actually writing in coefficients of equation right here so we know that anytime we go from moles of one substance to moles of another substance in a chemical reaction, it's always going to be related by the coefficients of the balanced chemical equation. Okay, so here you can see we're starting with our 3.5 moles of N2. And so like we looked at on the expanded mole diagram, we want to go from moles of N2 to moles of NH3. So the first thing that I would do is I would set up my conversion from moles of N2, that's what I have, and it goes on the bottom, to moles of NH3, and that's what I want, and so that's gonna go on the top. And so then from there, that mole to mole ratio comes from the coefficients of the balanced chemical equation. So if you remember the equation that we used before, uh, it was three moles of, I'm sorry, I said that wrong, it was two moles of NH3 to one mole of N2. And so then typically when I do a problem like this, I usually like to set it up with the units first. So I know I'm going from moles of N2 to moles of NH3, and then I would fill in the numbers from the balanced chemical equation. So then if you look at this, like the math on this isn't even difficult. You really don't even need a calculator. It's basically going to be 3.5 times 2 over 1, which is times 2. Uh, and so then to significant figures, that would be 7.0 moles of NH3. And so what that means is if we react 3.5 moles of N2, that should produce 7 moles of NH3 based on the stoichiometric coefficients of our balanced chemical equation. So a second type of question that we could answer using the expanded mole diagram and using the concept of stoichiometry has to do with relating the number of molecules that have reacted uh, or have been produced from a particular reaction, um, either reactant to reactant or product to product. So in this case, we're actually working backwards. It gives us the number of uh, molecules of ammonia here, and it's asking how many hydrogen molecules would need to react to produce that many molecules of ammonia. And so again, uh, I would send you back to or have you look at the expanded mole diagram here. Uh, so in this case, we're going from molecules to molecules. Molecules are down in this lower box, right? That's a number of particles. Uh, molecules would be considered particles. Atoms would be considered particles. And so here we are going from number of particles of A, which again, we said that's going to be ammonia, to number of particles of B, which we said there would be hydrogen, H2, okay? And so if we look at the path from particles of A to par particles of B, uh, that path looks like it takes three steps, right? So the first step is to convert from particles of A to moles. The second step is to cross the bridge to go moles of A to moles of B using the stoic coefficients uh, of the reaction. And then the last step there would be to go from moles of B down to particles of B. Uh, and so before we actually go through that three-step process of doing all that work, I want you guys to notice something. And what I'd like you to notice is, as we go from particles of A to moles of A, 
It says here we will divide by Avogadro's number. And when we go from moles of B to particles of B, it says here we will multiply by Avogadro's number. And so you guys should understand that if you multiply and divide by the same number, um, that mathematically will cancel itself out. And so we really don't have to do those two mathematical steps. The only mathematical step that we need is this conversion from moles of A to moles of B. And so instead of making this three-step process, we can have a direct route to go from particles of A directly to particles of B using the stoichiometric coefficients of the balanced chemical equation. Uh, and we're going to do that in just a second. Before we do that, I do want to point out to you as well, uh, there is one more place that that can happen here on the expanded mole diagram, and that's when we go from volume of A to volume of B, right? So if we were going to take that three-step process from volume to moles, moles of A to moles of B, and moles of B to volume of B, you can see here what we would do is we would be dividing by uh, the molar volume of a gas at STP, 22.4 cubic decimeters per mole. And then when we take this step here, we would be multiplying by that same number. Again, those two things would cancel each other out. And so we can, again, produce a shortcut here to go from volume of A to volume of B, uh, simply using the coefficients of the balanced chemical equation. And so let's go ahead and work out that example to go from particles of A to particles of B. All right, so on this one, we are starting with 200 molecules of NH3. Uh, and we are asked to go to molecules of H2. Remember, uh, we don't have to take that three-step process. We can go directly from molecules to molecules simply using the coefficients of the balanced chemical equation. So again, just like I did last time, the first thing I'm going to do is set up my conversion factor, and then that is going to start with molecules of NH3 on the bottom because NH3 is what I have, and I want to end up with molecules of H2 on the top. And so then looking at the balanced chemical equation, that is the relationship that will allow me to go from molecules of one substance to molecules of another substance. Uh, there are three molecules of H2 for every two molecules of NH3. And again, this one is really probably not too complicated to calculate without a calculator. Basically what I'm doing here is I am going to multiply by three and then divide by two. So 200 times three is 600, and then 600 divided by two is 300. And so what that's going to equal there is 300 molecules of H2 would be required in order to produce 200 molecules of NH3. So in this particular example, you can see that uh, we've got a different chemical reaction. Uh, we're starting with silver nitrate and aluminum chloride, and the products are silver chloride and aluminum nitrate. Uh, and in this question, we are given a certain mass of aluminum chloride, and we're asked to figure out uh, how many grams or the mass of silver chloride that would be produced from a complete reaction of that 200 grams. And so in this case, we are going from mass to mass. So if we look at the expanded mole diagram, we are starting with the mass of A and we are moving on to the mass of B. And so if we look at that, it looks like it should take four, I'm sorry, three steps, mass of A to moles of A. Uh, and you can see it's saying using the atomic mass or the formula mass of the compound or the element that is A. Uh, then of course we are going to use the coefficients of the equation to do what I call cross the bridge from moles of A to moles of B. And then finally, we'll go from moles of B to mass of B using the atomic mass or formula mass of B. Now, in this case, there is no shortcut when we go from mass to mass. And the reason for that is because the formula mass of every compound and every element are different, right? So if I'm gonna go from mass of A to moles of A, uh, which I think in this case we said was aluminum chloride, the formula mass for aluminum chloride is different 
than what the formula mass for B would be. And I think we said that would be silver chloride, right? So when we go from moles of B to grams of B or moles of silver chloride to grams of silver chloride, this is a different number as well. And so uh, as a result of those two numbers being different, there is no shortcut to go from mass of A to mass of B. We actually have to do all three steps and we're gonna go ahead and do that right now. All right, so here we are starting with our 200 grams of AlCl3, following the steps in the mole diagram. The first step is to go from grams of AlCl3 to moles of AlCl3. So I'm gonna set up a conversion factor to go from grams to moles. All right, so here you would want to use your periodic table and a calculator to determine the formula mass of AlCl3. So that's one aluminum and three chlorine. And so if I add that up, I will come up with 133.33 grams per one mole, and that is step one. Step two is to do what I call cross the bridge. We're going to go from moles of one substance, AlCl3, to moles of a different substance, AgCl. And so we are going to go from moles of AlCl3 to moles of AgCl. It's super important that you keep that well organized, what you're going from on the bottom and what you're going to on the top. If you flip that, certainly your calculation will come out incorrect. And so if we look at the mole ratio from the balanced chemical equation, that is three moles of silver chloride to one mole of aluminum chloride. And then our last step is going to be to go from moles of silver chloride to grams of silver chloride, right? And so that is going to be moles To grams and so then we also would want to look up uh, on our periodic table the formula mass for silver chloride that's one silver and one chlorine we should come up with 143.32 grams per one mole and so then when we go to make this calculation here uh, we are going to divide by anything in the denominator so 133.33, multiply by anything in the numerator times three, and then multiply by anything in the numerator times 143.32. Um, you can do that you know, other ways as well. I know some people like to just multiply everything on the top and then divide everything on the bottom. Uh, so whatever you're most comfortable with, there are many ways that you can uh, end up with the correct calculation. But if we do that calculation uh, to four significant figures, we come out with 645.0, oops, 0 0.0 grams of silver chloride, right? And so what that means is if we reacted 200 grams of aluminum chloride and all of it reacted in this particular reaction, this is the mass of silver chloride that should be produced by that. Okay, so in this final example for today, you guys can see that we've got another reaction here. Uh, the reaction between carbon dioxide and water uh, to produce sucrose and oxygen gas. Uh, and so you can see we've got a new balanced chemical equation that we're going to be using. Uh, this example is just a little bit different because this example has given us a volume of a gas, carbon dioxide, right? So it gives us this particular volume. Uh, and it is asking us the number of grams of sucrose that would be formed. So how many grams of this, what mass of this particular product would be formed from that particular volume of carbon dioxide. And so if we go to the expanded mole diagram, we are given a volume that we start with, right? So it's the volume of carbon dioxide and we're asked for a mass of sucrose. So that's gonna be this box here that we wanna end up in. And so this should take us three steps. So it's gonna be one, two, three steps from volume of carbon dioxide to moles of carbon dioxide, cross the bridge from moles of carbon dioxide to moles of sucrose, and then finally using the 
formula mass of sucrose will go from moles of sucrose to grams of sucrose. Sometimes students ask, uh, can we go from volume of A to volume of B and then down to moles of B and mass of B? The answer is mathematically you actually can and it would come out to be the same. However, theoretically, when you're going from volume of A to volume of B, that should be volume of a gas to volume of a different gas. Uh, and so in this case, since sucrose is a solid, uh, we would technically not want to take that approach. We would want to go from volume of A to moles of A, moles of A to moles of B, and then moles of B to mass of B. And we're going to go ahead and do that right now. All right, so on our last one here, we are starting with 115 cubic decimeters of carbon dioxide. And so the first move here, per the mole diagram, is to go from volume of CO2 to moles of CO2. So we're going to go from cubic decimeters to moles. And if you look at the mole diagram, it does give you that relationship. Maybe you remember it from a previous lesson as well. Uh, one mole of any gas contains 22.4 cubic decimeters of that gas when we are at standard temperature and pressure. In all of our uh, calculations here, you will be at standard temperature and pressure. Okay. Um, and so then from there, we want to cross the bridge. We want to go from moles of carbon dioxide to moles of sucrose, right? So moles CO2 on the bottom, moles of sucrose, which is C12, H22, O11 on top. Of course, that comes from the balanced chemical equation. And so if you look at your balanced chemical equation, it is one mole of sucrose to 12 moles of carbon dioxide. And then our last move here is to go from moles to grams. That's what the question is asking for. So we want moles of sucrose on the bottom and grams of sucrose on the top. And so again here, we're gonna use our periodic table to determine that molar mass. Looks like it's 342.34 grams per one mole. All right, and then we're going to finish up with the calculation. Uh, 115, and I, again, I don't know how you guys like to do this. You can do it however you want. You can just multiply everything on top, then divide everything on bottom, or you can go one step at a time, which is how I usually do it. I would divide, then divide, then multiply, but it's kind of up to you however you want to do it. Uh, to three significant figures, which is what we started with here, we should come out with 146 grams of sucrose. C12, H22, O11.